And there's two things interesting about this, and that is the phrase, holiness to the Lord, and where we see that pop up again, but also the idea of something being on someone's forehead. So the first thing I want to look at is over in Zechariah chapter 14. And you ought to really get familiar with Zechariah because it's a key to understanding the book of Revelation. If you ever want to understand Revelation, Zechariah is one of the main books. Genesis, uh, Psalms, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah. Those are all very key books to understanding uh, the book of Revelation. But in Zechariah 14, the book, the whole book it has 14 chapters. It ends in verse 20 and 21. And it says, in that day... Now, you always look at that phrase because when that's talking about the last days, it's talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord isn't the rapture. The day of the Lord is after the rapture. The day of the Lord is when God pours out His judgment and then at the end He saves Israel, Romans 11.25. When it refers to that day in, that, in the prophetic con uh, context or the day of the Lord, uh, the de time of Jacob's trouble... Uh, Jesus called the time of great tribulation. That all refers to the same period of time, the, the last seven years. And it says, In that day, verse 20, shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness under the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. That is saying that, okay, you, you think about bells. We talked about that last week. The bells were on the hem of the garment of the high priest. When he entered into the Holy of Holies, you could tell he was still alive because he's walking around in there and it's still ding a ling a ling a ling a ling. I always said when he'd stop and he'd get quiet, everybody would get a little nervous and then they'd hear the bells again. Whew, he's still alive. Well, they were, they were in the practice of putting bells on the horses, but that wasn't considered a holy thing. But God's saying in that day, when God sets up his kingdom, even the bells on the horses will be holiness to the Lord. In the priest, in the temple, they used to take their sacrifice and they actually would seethe, which means to cook the meat and eat it. I always said, you know, uh, uh, when, when you, if you were to transport yourself back to the time of the sacrifice and be in Jerusalem any day, any time, if you were there during the time of the sacrifice, they sacrificed every morning and every night, you would go in there, you'd smell, oh man, that's making me hungry. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. That's not blasphemy. <laughs> You're smelling what God calls Himself a sweet savor. And God loves the smell of a barbecue. <laughs> That's what it was. You know, they would take that meat and they'd throw it on the grill and they ate it. And so He's saying even when they would take the meat of the sacrifice, the pots were considered unclean and you would have to wash them ritually, but it was to clean them and purify them. But even in that day, even the pots will be holiness to the Lord. And so what He's saying is that when everything's fulfilled, the Messiah returns and the kingdom is a kingdom of holiness from one end to the other, from top to bottom, everything in it will be purified by His presence. Jesus, the glorified, risen Lord, is going to be on the earth. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? It says that you will travel to Jerusalem. You will offer gifts to Christ. Right there, in, we will go to Him face to face and actually offer a gift, and there will be Jesus in His glorified state. Just an awesome thought. It's what we're living for. That's home. <laughs> this world is not my home. That world is. <laughs> Amen? Now, one more thing, though. Is when it talks about this thing on the forehead, it's very interesting. Go over to Revelation, and it's one of the verses I use tonight for the sword drill, and that's Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. And there it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. It's a mystery 
but it's a clear teaching throughout Scripture that there's something spiritual about the forehead. God talks about a seal on their foreheads, and that's why Satan counterfeits it during the tribulation period and puts a mark on their foreheads. Satan counterfeits everything. Satan will counterfeit everything God has, Satan has. You've got the Holy Bible, Satan comes out with the Satanic Bible. You got the Church of Jesus Christ. Satan's come out with many counterfeit churches. We have a Savior. Satan has his saviors who have come out all through 2,000 years since Christ died, was buried, and rose again. We have a Christ. He's going to have an Antichrist. Now, look at this. Uh, I want to let's just uh, check this out. We got time. Ezekiel. I want to show you this. This is amazing. In Ezekiel 28. And we were reading, this is another example of the counterfeit. Now, if you kept your finger there in Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Exodus 28, we're going to Ezekiel 28, but if you kept your finger in Exodus 28, you'll see there that uh, the setting of the stones on the priest was given in Exodus 28, verse 17. It said, And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row, verse 18, shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And verse 19, And the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, verse 20, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. That's what was on the high priest. Now look what it says about Satan in Ezekiel 28. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy, thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, and so forth. This is talking about Satan, and yet Satan has the same stones covering him that covered the high priest. Satan is not an ugly creature. Paul said not to be surprised the fact that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers as the ministers of righteousness. If anybody thinks that some preacher, because he's on TV or on the radio and he sounds nice and he holds a Bible in his hands, that makes him a Christian preacher, that is a fool. You have to understand, Satan is slick, and when he puts his preacher in the pulpit, he ain't go, it's not going to be obvious that it's Satan's preacher. He's going to make him sound. He's going to use the same words you use. The only difference is he'll define them differently. He'll use a book, but it'll be from Alexandria and not from Antioch. He'll have a church, but it will not preach the gospel. I mean, we've sat and listened to these guys, the Osteen and these guys. They do not preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. They say some cute little thing about asking Jesus in your heart and this and that. That's not the gospel. That's the result of believing the gospel. If you believe the true gospel. But if you're just asking some Jesus to come in your heart, you could be asking some Mexican mechanic to come in your heart. I mean, Jesus, Jesus, that means nothing. The only Jesus that can save you is not the Jesus that can climb in your heart. It's a Jesus that died for your sins, shedding His blood, was buried, and rose again. That's the only Jesus that saves. And Satan will counterfeit, will tweak, will change, and all he has to do is throw in one little word, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.5. One little word. Go look at how he talked to Jesus in the wilderness when he tempted Him. He didn't quote the Satanic Bible, he quoted the Psalms. 